All right, thanks for, whoa, there we are. Hey, thanks for being here today, everyone. Thanks for chatting, that's exciting. Chatting is good. Good singing today. Hey, I hope everyone has had a great week. It's nice to have a little break from the 90 plus degree weather, isn't it? Oh my gosh. Uh, we're going to pray, we're going to run. Lord, we're grateful for you. Uh, we love you. We pray for your spirit to lead and guide to all truth right now, because that's what, it, that's what you do. We pray that you would, um, your word would speak for what it's intended to say to us for this time, for this place. And uh, we love you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, we were up at uh, Cham- uh, Chambers Lake yesterday, up in the Pooter, and we had not seen the, the fire. Remember last year, remember the fire in the midst of the pandemic, in the midst of whatever else was going on? You remember that? Political unrest and all those other things. Um, so we went up there, and it was like, I felt like a little, uh, like, it was better than I thought, but still terrible. You know, like, I'm like, it's not all burnt, but it's burnt. And it was really uh, kind of uh, interesting because, you know, you had all this char and black and nothingness. And then in the ground, the ground's, like, all green now. And all the plants are starting to grow, and there's little, these little saplings. And you're like, okay, this is hopeful, right? 20 years from now, 30 years from now, we're going to have a forest again. It's going to be great. Uh, it kind of reminded me of what we're going to talk about today because we're going to talk about redemption. And uh, yesterday, or last year when we were watching the fire, we'd watch the little, we'd watch the little updates. Would you guys watch the Facebook updates? And they'd be talking about places, and I had no idea what they're talking about. Like, I don't know where County Road 473 is. I don't know any of this, but thanks for helping out, firefighters. You did great. Um, but now we're up there. I'm like, man, this is not as bad as I thought, and it's growing again, and that is a good sign. So we've been talking about identity, and we're going to be talking about identity, until Jesus comes back, whenever that is, we don't know. Um, and so in our culture, we all shape our identity around something, okay? No matter what you do, who you believe in, how you, do you believe in God or not, you shape your identity around something. We all do, right? Whether it's your, your looks, I mean, like me. You laugh too much, Julie, that's okay. <laughs> that was a good one. Um, or it's, your, you know, being in shape, or it's your career, or it's your children, or whatever it is, we all shape our identity around something. Or now, we live this, what I call a segmented, siloed identity, where our values and our belief systems don't always affect every part of us, but we have these little moments, this is how I am at work, this is how I'm at home, this is how I do my recreation, this is how I believe politically, this is how I believe socially, whatever it may be. And so what we want to do over the next X amount of days and weeks and months is we want to try to align our identity, all the things we are and all the things we do and who we are as a person through the filter and through the head of Christ being the one that we live and work and function in. Because Christ died for us, and not only does he give us heaven on earth and heaven someday, but he reshapes who we are. And he has things to say about the way we live and the way we believe. So every area of our lives, we're going to try to put it together like a house that's built on the rock of Christ or like Christ the head and everything trickles down. And we want to be in him and we want to live in an identity that's filtered through him, every aspect of us. That doesn't mean that we lose ourselves. It's actually we become who God has created us to be. Okay? Are we good? Good. All right, Ephesians chapter 1. You can follow along on the Bible app or in an actual Bible if you have one of those. Those are handy. To have as well. Last week, we talked about being chosen and how God chose us and picked us because he wanted to, not because he had to, not because you were an accident or mistake, but he designed you and chose you before time began because he wanted to. He saw you and who you're going to be, and everything he has done has sh- tried to show you that he chose you to be he- with him and connected to him in Christ. The first week, we talked about being a new creation, and today we're going to talk about being redeemed. So Ephesians 1, 7 through 10, we'll read it, and then we'll talk about it. In him, which is the theme, we're in Christ. We have safety and security in him. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. So, full disclosure, this, these scriptures that we're reading are really, really dense. If you ever read the scripture and you read it, you're like, I have no clue. Anybody feel that way? I feel that way, too. So we're all in the same boat. This is a good plan. 
So it takes a little bit of time to think and reread. And what I'm telling you today, I probably read like 40 times, okay? So just, you're not, I'm not like a theologian, didn't go to Bible college. So wrong good hands here. But it's very dense, so we're going to talk about it together. So we are redeemed. What does being redeemed mean? To gain possession of something in exchange for payment is the actual definition of redemption. Basically, it's like a, you ever, any, any coupon people here that are like coupon people? Like I got a coupon for everything? Okay, I won't make fun of you. Um, it's, you go and you redeem your coupon. This is giving you payment for something that you want. Or who loves the redemption story in movies? Oh my gosh. Those get me every time. The redemption. We watched what was Raya and the Last Dragon. We, did you watch that? Disney Plus? Kids? All, everyone with kids is like, yes, and Marita. Um, and, <laughs> and it was like this redemption story, and it gets me every time. It's like this person that didn't deserve it, that made the mistakes, that blew it, and then they redeemed themselves by doing the right thing at the right time. That's exciting. Like, you know, Star Wars, Anakin Skywalker, or this is going to be nerdy, bear with me, Boromir from Lord of the Rings. I mean, come on. If you don't know that reference, shame on you. We'll get, we'll get you caught up. Or, I th- or one of my favorite movies of all time, Dumb and Dumber. Have you seen this movie? I think about the scene where they drive in, away from the Rocky Mountains into the Nebraska, and he goes and s- trades his car for the bike and totally redeems himself. Remember that? <laughs> I love redemption stories. In Christ, you and I are a redemption story. That you and I have contributed to the brokenness of this world in our own lives. We've made mistakes. We've sinned, we've been cruel to others, we've thought horrible things. It's hopeful, I promise. We've made, we've, we've, God knows everything we've been through, but yet he chose to redeem us, to make us whole. And what this is, what's really important to understand throughout this message, throughout this time, is that we understand that we were and are, at times, the, we do contribute to the evil of this world, Right? We contribute to the brokenness. We have sin. The Bible says, if someone says they have no sin, they are deceived. That our mistakes and our brokenness, we should feel that weight so that we can feel the weight of Christ's redemption in our life. That I am undeserved of God's love. I am undeserved of his freedom. I am undeserved of this, of this platform and these people and my family. I'm undeserved, but in God's grace and his goodness, while we were still broken, while we were still sinners, Christ still died for us. And so it's important to understand, redeemed people need to understand that we were redeemed from something. There is a reason why Jesus had to come and die, and his blood needed to be shed to cover and to reset and to restore us. In our, our, our culture, it gets a little dicey if you say that you contribute to evil, right? It make you feel uncomfortable. It's like, no, I don't. I'm good all the time. Just look what I posted on Facebook. Look how good I am. Look what I did this week. I mean, I'm so good, right? It's a really big deal, and people miss, the reason why people don't even in, want to engage in worship or in this kind of thankfulness of God is because they don't always feel like they've contributed to the brokenness of the world. We've all done things. We all fall short. We all continue to feel selfish things and do selfish things in our lives, and we're great people, and God loves you, and there's no shame here. That's not the point, but, the, but to be redeemed and to be a redeemed person, you have to re- realize that we were redeemed from something into something. And God is continually redeeming us over and over again. And it's a really, really cool thing. In the midst of our struggles, in the midst of our brokenness, God is, keeps redeeming, keeps restoring, keeps making us new. So the first thing we got to kind of grasp is, yeah, I, I, I got to own my part. I got to own my part in the, my sin brought Jesus to the cross just as much as the next person just as much as the person that I disagree with the most and I think is the most evil. I've been a part of that. Okay, that sounds like a bummer. Thanks, Aaron. Ephesians says this, so we'll read the first verse. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our sins or our trespasses, the things that separate us, according to the riches of his grace that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. What does that mean? It means God, Jesus, fully knows who you are, the good and the bad and the ugly. He totally knows everything you've ever done, everything I've ever done, and it's not been pretty. But with fullness of understanding, Christ died. That means that he didn't die for you because you were really great and he really loved you. He died for you because you are his creation, because you are his son and his daughter, you are his brother and sister. See, with full knowledge and understanding, God said, 
I know exactly what they're going to do. I know exactly how humanity is going to work, and it's not going to be pretty at times. But with the full knowledge and understanding, I'm going to still die for them. I'm going to still die for humanity. I'm still going to die for Aaron, though in his faithlessness, he still makes so many mistakes. We are redeemed by Christ fully, and he fully knows you, every secret, everything that if you, would, you are still ashamed of that you shouldn't, every, every word that you've thought, every doubt that you have, every fear that you grin and bear and bite your lip about, God, with full understanding, still redeemed you. And he wasn't like, oh, I guess I gotta fix this person again. Sheesh. No. It's like your children. It's like, I know that you are screwing up. I know that things are going wrong. I know that this, your brain is not fully wrinkled yet. But I'm gonna continue to lift you up, continue to bring you back, and in full knowledge and understanding of who you and I are and who the worst person is in all humanity, in your opinion, Christ still redeemed. Christ still died. Christ still loved. That's such good news, isn't it? And it's like, if I see myself as a contributor of evil, like I'm still selfish, I still am broken, I think about the things I have done to people who didn't deserve it, how I was not caring, and I was not kind, and I was not good to them. But while I was still a sinner, which I still am, but Christ still died, knowing full well the things that I do. So your goodness is nothing. Right? God's not like super impressed by your goodness. Right? He is shaping you into your full potential, and that he is excited about. But he sees all of it. And if my good and my bad were outweighed, I'm not sure where I'd end up. And good thing I don't have to worry about it. Because Christ died in the midst of that. And we are redeemed. We okay? Okay, you're a contributor to evil. Tell people that's what you learned about at church today. <laughs> what did you learn about church? I'm a contributor to evil. What a hopeful church this is. <laughs> One time I worked for a guy, and I was in a meeting. Do you ever, like, lie for no reason? And you, like, don't even think about it. And you just, like, say a lie. You just, like, panic and lie. Okay, maybe that's just me. But um, I was in a meeting, and I didn't do something. And I was like, oh, no. And I didn't want to disappoint this person. And I said, yep, I did it. And I'm like, crap, I got to go do that. Right? And then when I got out of the meeting, I felt really convicted. I was like, ooh, can't lie to the pastor of the church. <laughs> can't do that. No, you can. And, um, and so I felt really bad. And I went, and I was like, hey, man, I'm sorry. I totally lied to you right there. And he was like, and he, this is what he did. He went, yes. And I was like, what? He cheered. And I was like, what? He's like, this is how we build intimacy. This is how we build connection. He's like, I know you lied to me. I know, I know that you didn't do that. I was like, yeah, I'm sorry. And I was like, and I got a glimpse of this idea of grace. That God knows full well of what I've done and what I will do. And when I own my part, God's just like, it's just this welcoming there's no like, well, you're going to have to sit the next one out, buddy. You know, there's none of that. You know, knowing full well, uh, he died for you. He redeemed you. Redemption is a good thing. It's something we should still embrace and still grasp. And I know as we grow in our faith, sometimes it's hard to forget the brokenness that God saved us from. Or the things that had separated us. Or the things in our lowest moments that we were saved from. That's why um, Eugene Peterson said, really, Christianity is a religion for the poor and the broken and the weak because the poor and the broken and the weak feel the weight of God's grace more than the rest of us. And in our strength, sometimes, we forget about the goodness of God to save and to restore and to heal and to forgive and to set us free. And we just sometimes forget. And God says, in him you are redeemed. And we'll talk a second about what a redeemed person looks like. Verse 9. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he proposed in Christ as a plan for the right time to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things that are on earth. That's a lot. Okay? That means redeemed people get to share in the mysteries of God. If you read the New Testament, if you read, the if you read Christ, he talks a lot about the treasures, the hidden things, the secret things that God wants to reveal to us in relationship with him. It is like this treasure that, ne that is given, but we haven't always opened it up to experience it before and yet, and the fullness of it. There was a man who was, uh, had a leaky roof. I did not do his roof, just so you know. And... Um, it was like in Georgia or something. 
and he had a leaky roof, and he was like, what's going on? He, they ripped up his roof, and in this roof, they found this big, like, like kind of tube, this cardboard tube thing, and they took it out, and in it was a portrait that someone had put up there, and it was worth $113 million. And he was like, I'm glad I had a leaky roof, right? And many of us think that is how the mysteries of God are like, that you are not going to experience him unless it's just a miracle. It's like, I bought a house and there's a gold mine underneath. Sweet, that's awesome. Like, that's not how it is. It is fully knowing that God has given you the keys to the kingdom, the treasures from heaven, the th- a window of heaven and earth, a connection to the creator, and not experiencing it the way he wants you to. Right? This is what Jesus says about the kingdom. Jesus talks about the kingdom a lot. We'll talk more about the kingdom next week. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in the field. And the man found and reburied it. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. So he knows there's a treasure there. He sells everything because he knows that this treasure is more important than anything else. See, redeemed people understand that the mysteries and treasures of God have been freely given to them, and they spend their life exploring and experiencing and, and removing things that maybe will inhibit the experience of this treasure that is the kingdom, that is God bringing heaven to earth in our lives. Then in 45 it says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and bought it. See, we have an unlocked treasure chest, and we don't need a map, right? You ever see City Slickers? That's a great movie. (laughs) I know you're going to watch it next week, City Slickers. It's like, there's no map, but there there is drenched in relationship with God, he wants to help you experience the mysteries of his will, of his good pleasing will. These are the, ver- these are the words, words in there. They're not like, oh, you should feel ashamed for what you've done, and maybe I'll save you someday. There's no verbiage like that. that is, there's no gospel like that. The actual gospel is this, God did everything he could to reconnect his creation to, his, to the creator. And not only that, but he, he gave the treasure and mysteries and the hidden things to us to experience. And what that means for you, no one else can do. No one else can do that for you. God wants to experience your creative potential with him. Wow, that's a lot. How are we going to do that? That's going to be stressful, okay? How do we live as redeemed people? People who realize, man, I was broken, God saved me. I was lost, and now I'm found. However that works for you, whatever resonates with you. The first thing is redeemed people are really grateful. Redeemed people, people that I know who have had the hardest experiences, and if God has saved them from it, are the most grateful people, right? It's people that don't feel like they're, they've been saved from much that are less grateful, but people who feel like they've been saved from a lot are so grateful. It's like, man, I don't deserve any of this. Holy cow. And the truth is, everyone's the equal contributor in God's eyes, but people who have really experienced God's grace really are, no, they know, man, I'm so grateful. I've been given time and time again remember the things they've done and where they've come from. They don't think, take things for granted. They're very humble. They're just grateful to be around, to be engaged in what God's doing in this world. People are grateful. You ever get, do you ever get an undeserved gift? Have you got one of those? Sometimes I'll get like an undeserved gift. Like one day I was like asking a friend, hey, I'm, I'm looking for this guitar amp. What do you know, think about it? He's like, I have one for you. Here it is. And he just gave it to me. And I was like, what? And I was like, that is an undeserved And if you knew the situation, that is an undeserved gift because my heart isn't always great. But that's what God's grace is. It's just a lavished upon gift to you that you didn't deserve and I didn't deserve. So I I should be incredibly grateful. This is what it says. Jesus is sitting with the Pharisee, Simon. And the woman is there and she's wiping, she's crying and weeping over him and wiping her tears on his feet with his, with her hair, right? It's a really intimate moment. And she's doing this at dinner, and there's other people there, which would be strange, right? But she's, she's just lavishing her love on Jesus. And the, and the Pharisee's like, why would you let this woman, who's unclean, quote-unquote, do this to you? And Jesus says this, a creditor had two debtors. One owed him 500 denarii, or 500 million dollars, I'm just kidding, and the other owed him 50 Since they could not pay it back, he graciously forgave both of them. So which of them who love him would love him more? 
And Simon answered, I suppose the one who is forgiven more. You judge correctly, Jesus said. Turning to the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she with her tears has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet since I had came in. And you didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has been anointing my feet with, her, with perfume. Therefore I tell you, her sins that are many have been forgiven. That's why she loves much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. See, people that understand that the weight of my sin and my brokenness is the same as everyone else's, I should be so grateful to God for his grace that while I was broken, he forgave me. And that should change the way I see the world. I should be grateful for every breath. I should be grateful for every experience, the goodness of God in my life. We should be grateful people. Jesus' followers should not be scarcity people. They should be so grateful, so happy, so wonderfully enjoying life because of the God who saved them in spite of the things that they've done and the things that I've done. So, redeemed people are really grateful. How are we doing on our gratefulness? In my life, sometimes I'm grateful for like a minute and then something happens. I'm like, what the heck? My computer won't start. Jeez. You know, my gratefulness goes out the window. Do you know that gratefulness is a muscle that you train? Gratefulness is something that you discipline yourself to become, to remind yourself of where you've been and that you respond to things with gratefulness. And that's not a natural human response. The next thing is redeemed people are gracious. Ephesians 4 says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. We never experience those things. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as Christ has forgiven you. See, redeemed people are also very gracious. They are not easily offended. They can make a ton of allowances for other people's faults. They are easy to forgive others. It's easier to forgive others. They don't get bitter because they realize the same thing that that person's dealing with, I've been saved from. I'm not higher or lower or better or worse. I have made different cards than you've been dealt, maybe, but we are all in the same boat, the same experiences, and I can be gracious. I can be unoffended by the things that are happening in the culture. It amazes me how people get offended by cultural things from people that you don't even know. How does this really affect your life? As followers of Jesus, how do these things culturally, politically, socially affect your life? Your life is affected by the kingdom of heaven in your life, and then you bring the kingdom wherever you go, so you are not affected by the culture around you. You are an effector of the culture around you, of the people around you, because the love of Jesus abides and lives and resonates from you. So we, are, we should be gracious people. Oh my gosh, God saved me. God saved you too. You just don't know yet. It's okay. We shouldn't be offended. We shouldn't be afraid. We shouldn't feel like, oh gosh, this is inhibiting something in my life because it is not. Because the kingdom and the king dictates what happens in your life. Redeemed people are gracious. Make allowances for other people's faults. We can judge less. We can love more. We can be more compassionate, more kind, and we can like look past the things that maybe for others would be inhibitors because we just can see the person, because Jesus sees me as the person I was created to be. So our job as followers of Jesus is to see the person that God created that person to be through the other stuff. And if I'm redeemed, they're redeemed. And I can see them the way God sees me, undeserved grace, undeserved love. So we should be less offended. I think most of you are. I'm proud of you. Right? Why do we get offended by people like on TV? Like, I'll never see that person. It doesn't affect my life. If you feel like it affects your life, you need to center the life of Christ around you because you know that Christ is the one who dictates and leads and guides and works and has your days ahead of you. Enough about that. Last thing, and you guys come up. Come up. Last thing, and we're going to close. As redeemed people gather, I had to use three G words. It's the rule for <laughs> preaching has to be a G word. <laughs> Took like 20 minutes to figure that out, but it's fine. <laughs> if you read the verbiage of this letter, there is never a hint of this is how you should be, ever. 
You should read it, read it in the context of a collective of people. The, the letter of the, to the Ephesians is written to a group, to a church, to a people. It's not even to one group of people. It's to the churches in the whole area. And what Paul is trying to say and remind us of is that, listen, when redeemed people gather, he says, listen, we are redeemed. We are the ones that God has chosen. We are the ones that are in our new creation. It's, and we live in a culture that's all about me and I and myself, Right? And we think about our own brokenness, our own problems, our own successes, our own failures. And Paul's like not really trying to send that message. He's trying to say, you are the redeemed people. And when you gather in the culture that's really crazy and you're trying to all sort it out, gather as the redeemed, as people who God chose and called and saves and loves. And when you do that, that is going to be an attractive model to the world. It is going to be something that not just strengthens you, but strengthens a group so that when they are, we are out into the world sharing Christ's love, we do that with the confidence that other people that are redeemed are doing the same thing. When the church started, it was attractive to a broken world and a world that was persecuting this group. And it was attractive not because they were super good worship leaders or the preaching was great or anything like that. Their buildings were awesome. It was attractive for this reason, and this is what it says. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together, and here's the thing, with glad and sincere hearts. And they praised God, and they enjoyed the favor of all people. And God and the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. See, redeem the beauty of gathering together like we are right now. It's not like, okay, we got to do this religious activity. It's no. Redeem people connecting to redeem people. People that are grateful for the things that God has done, connecting together and sharing each other's burdens and encouraging each other and cheering each other on because we're all in the same boat. We're grateful we're gracious, and when we gather, there's something profound that happens. As we take communion this morning, you can get your communion ready. It might take a minute because of the flap. There's a, there's a little flap with the wafer and a second flap with the juice. You can get that ready. But you know that uh, communion was never meant to be a personal thing either. It was meant to be a collective thing that you remembered the life of Christ and what he did for us that you remembered that, man, in my brokenness, Jesus went and he experienced every ounce of physical pain and he, his blood was shed for me. And not just for me, for us. And so when you take communion, and, and if you come from a tradition that you have to have certain things for communion, we just believe if you're a follower of Jesus, you can take communion. And if you're just searching, you can take communion. What a great invitation to Christ's story. Good luck, everybody. <laughs> It's really funny to watch you from up here. <laughs> All right, I'm going to pray. First, I'll pray for you guys to open those things, and then I'll pray for communion. We're going to take it together. Lord Jesus, we just thank you that we can be uh, counted as one of the redeemed, as one of the people that you died for, that you poured out your blood for, that you shared your life with. Lord Jesus, I pray for this group of people today. First, that their little fingers would be able to pry the plastic off and get the wafer out. Second of all, uh, I pray just that when we experience communion together, it is not just for, for me individually to remember what I've done, but it's that you died for this world. For God so loved this whole world that you gave your son. And this is the remembrance. This is the, the sacred thing we do to remember. It says whenever you take this this bread and, and drink this cup. We proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We proclaim that my sin and your sin and the world's sin took Jesus to the cross and Christ's cross saved and washed clean and made whole and gave new identity to all of us. So today we remember. We remember what you did, Jesus. We are grateful as redeemed people. God, we are gracious, not just to ourselves. Maybe we should start with that, but to others. God, and as we take this together, a gathering of believers, redeemed, saved, loved, commissioned to bring hope to the world. God, we want to take this bread and this cup as a renewal, as a, as a humbling, as a setting a discipline of gratefulness in our life. Because we are redeemed and we are thankful for that. So Jesus says, during supper. You took bread and you broke the bread and you said, this is what my body is going to go through. 
My body's going to go through a breaking. It says, whenever you take this bread, I want you to remember the pain that I went through for you. To the, by our stripes that we can be healed and we can be made whole. So let's take the bread together. And then after supper, the Lord, and they're all lounging around the table together, eating a great meal. And he poured the wine out and he gave everyone a little bit. He said, hey, this is going to be my blood that will be shed. And everything you, you guys are going to go through and everything you're going to struggle with and everything we're, we, uh, it's going to separate us or disqualify us or whatever it may be, this is going to redeem all of that. This is a new covenant, a new promise forgiveness of sins, a renewing. And when we do this, we're reminded that we are set free, that we are clean, that we are redeemed. So take the cup together. Thank you, Jesus, for your goodness and your grace. Why don't we stand up? We're going to sing this last song, and then we'll go. And during this song, I just want you to, this is a, it says that we're no longer slave to fear. We're children of God. And so I'm going to have you do something that we did last week. It's a little awkward but we're going to be okay, okay? Last week we said that I am chosen. We said it out loud because we believe that power of life and death is found in what we say. So we're going to say together, I'm redeemed, and we're going to pray that God would activate our faith to that we would actually believe it, not just say it. Are you ready? One, two, three. I am redeemed. Ooh, that was powerful. Let's sing this together.